So there's two criteria for proper requirement for restriction. And this is often misquoted on office actions. This is something to look for. From MPP 803, A, the inventions must be independent or distinct as claimed. And, notice the word and, office actions often, seem to be correcting this lately, they often say or, incorrect. There would be a serious burden on the examiner if restriction is not required. Serious burden. I've gotten things that say, oh, it's a burden as we're going to go to. That's very nice, it's a burden on you. Uh, my job, everyone's job, what we do, life can be a burden sometimes. The legal test is serious burden. If it's going to trouble you too much to do your job, I'm sorry, I'm finally responsible for arguing against that. <laughs> so it's rarely applied properly, but overcoming it is also hard, but getting easier because it's being applied left and right today, which is why I'm spending more time on this than you probably would think I would. So restrictions, next slide, restrictions are increasing. Overcoming is also increasing. This is an example. Uh, I found John Dudas's blog. He's the former USPTO commissioner. Uh, he said that in 1993 in biotech, there were 1,000 restrictions for 32,000 office actions. 2008, 22,000 restrictions for 42,000 office actions. I find it hard to believe that quick calculation, more than half of patent applications filed in biotech were for two totally different inventions. But that's what they do because practically speaking, the patent office gets double the money, the examiner gets double the time to do, to examine your patent application. But overcoming is also rising. So this is a source from Patently O blog, which is a great blog and I recommend to everybody. Um, get lots of great statistics on there. I love his stats. Biotech, 54% overcome the restriction. So these, these ridiculous number of restriction requirements, people are overcoming. Chemical, 21%. Computer, 6%. Mechanical, 18%. All right, moving on. Example is restriction likely to stick. So this is what I showed on the cover sheet of the response. Claims 1 to 10 are drawn to it. This is a direct quote out of the... Um, office action. Clips 1 to 10 are a method of making whatever, an article manufacture, class 265. Claims 11 through 20 are a device for making the exact same thing in class 425. So the prior art search revealed that for the past 20 years all the close prior art was restricted like this. I tried, you know, for, for let's try anyway, let's make a point didn't work. <laughs> I didn't get through it. I didn't actually petition, I just responded to the arguments. You know, you might try petitioning, but in this case, I didn't see it as so worth the client's money because I had seen in the prior art searches, every time there's a method and device for the same thing in these classes, didn't happen. So in the office action, the next slide, you can actually see he put a pretty thorough restriction, which I'm seeing more and more. He used the proper word and, as you see, is circled, and he said, one or more of the following reasons may apply. So he'd actually go through and say which ones apply. Now it's up to you. You want to argue against it? You've got to argue against all of them and say none of them apply. So different classification, different classes, subclasses, the state of the prior art, so forth. So oftentimes a different classification thing, you might look at the... Uh, uh, you know what, I'm going to hold off on my comment because I have it two slides down. So, next slide. Example of restriction you may overcome. This one, may overcome, I did overcome. Class, claims 15 through 20 are a method of playing a game of chance. Claims 11 to 14, balls for a ball selector. 1 through 10, the ball selector itself. I had a three-way restriction on this. Three ways. Balls for the ball selector and the ball selector itself. Truth be told, logically, I think you can hear maybe some uh, why you'd have restriction on that. But in this case, the first two were in class 273, uh, slightly different, different subclass. The last restriction was in a different class. So the office action, there would be a burden of search on the part of the examiner. I, I just do a Scooby-Doo, huh? <laughs> what do you mean? That's your job. As I said before, there's a burden. That's not the legal standard. I didn't respond that way. I didn't say, that's not the legal standard. You know, I responded. MPAP 803 says blah, blah, blah. Here, the office action states blah, blah, blah. <laughs> the two are not analogous. So what I did first is I look at the examiner's search report. It's right after the office action. Uh, a lot of people probably never look at a search report. I find them very intriguing. You see exactly how the examiner searched. Did he take five minutes to do the search because he was just moving on to the next one, didn't have time? Or did he do four searches over a three week period of time and he really looked into this? To give you a big clue, you know, one way or the other, where the examiner's holding. 
So what subclass of subclasses did they search? Now, if in his search, after you get this restriction, he searches class 273, subclass 269, subclass 144a, or you know, all of them that, are, that were in the restriction, look, examiner, you've already searched it. There's no search burden. There's no search burden if you've already done the search. It, um, you can say the prior art is in both of those classes and subclasses. The prior art that you searched, that's in there, that you, that, that you found, look, it's referred to, it's actually placed in both classes. Um, and always refer to the language of MPEP 803 um, and I, you know, use quotations, quote it, makes it look more formal because it is, because you're showing this is what you, the procedure is, this is the procedure to follow. So as I kind of went over in the next slide, a winning argument, you have to provisionally elect one group. You got no choice. You must say you're electing with traverse. You must say traverse means I got arguments. You must provide arguments with your traversal. You can't say traversal without arguments or it's treated as non-traversal. Best argument that I found personally, I don't know stats on this, but that I found that's, that's worked on more than one occasion is what I call the intertwinement argument. It means that my claims, claim in group A, group one rather, group one has features A, B, C, claim in, in um, two has a, B, D, so you might say C and D are different, but look, D is a dependent claim in group one. C over here is a dependent claim in group two. You're gonna have to do the same search anyway. You wanna say the different classes? Well, how are you gonna reject the dependent claim? You gotta search that just the same. It overlaps it. I mean, sometimes you might even draft claims with that in mind, because restriction requirements are so prevalent, you wanna make sure not to have a restriction, so, or to overcome it, you know, you intertwine your claims between the method and the device, you know, even if they're different, or between two different sets of device claims because I want to try this claim, I want to try that claim to li use different limitations, but I'll cover the other limitations in a dependent claim down in claim 14 and 16. And so I can say, look, there's no search burden. Um, and I have one on that argument. Um, so, uh, okay, next slide, a winning argument. Patents are any one of these groups likely placed in each subclass. You might say on the front of the patent where it lists the class and subclasses, the one searched and the one that it's placed in, you can see both of them. Uh, so the examiner will argue, as I already spoke about, independent claim has this, that one has the other things. So as I called it here, you preempt it uh, and so forth. I kind of already discussed this. Oh, and the other argument down here, if we follow your logic, because this one has feature D and this one has feature E and you're saying they need to be different, well, why don't you do that for each of my dependent claims which have a different limitation? Uh, this this uh, argument I actually got from Diane Gardner, I'm wondering if you're watching. Uh, you, you might say there's an eight-way restriction. You might say that there's lots of different restrictions here. You might say that um, uh, each dependent claim, you're saying because these independent claims lack a feature different? Well, if that feature is over here, the dependent claim under this one, hey, <laughs> you want you restrict that one too. And now that you're restricting that and that, instead of a two-way restriction, now you have a four-way and do that both ways, you might come up with an eight-way restriction based on the logic being implied in the restriction requirement. And you know, if restriction requirements were better, or you might say if examiners had more time to examine, then you know, we wouldn't have to go through these charades. I don't want to be spending so much time on it, but unfortunately, you know, restriction requirement tends to, uh, you know, I, I think it's, I hesitate to say something negative, but I think it's very overused, but I think most people would agree. All right, rejection under 101. So 101, quote the statute. I'm quoting it here, quote it in your response. New and useful process machine manufacture composition of matter. In practice, most 101 rejections for properly written applications are in business method patents. So if it's in something else, <laughs> Patent is probably right. Not always, but if you have a 101 rejection because uh, you're claiming a uh, signal is one that they don't like, that one you just, you know, you got to know you can't say signal, you have to say, use other terminology. You're claiming uh, ball lightning instead of a method of creating ball lightning, not, I shouldn't say creating a method of causing it to happen. Okay, that's a proper 101 rejection. But in software, it comes down to the wording. As you know, Bilski, Supreme Court, transformation of matter tied to specific machine. So, you know, it used to be people would use the words computer readable medium. Then we went through a brief period where you had to say computer readable storage medium. Now we say a processor configured to carry out the steps of blah, blah, blah. To me, it's a matter of wording. It's a matter of fighting with lexography in an area that's very hard to define. Where do you define the limits of abstract versus tangible? And unfortunately, a lot of it is the economy. How many patents being filed? Oh, shoot, we have too many not being filed now. 
uh, politics, you know, what's the backlog, all sorts of different things. But it is a hard area to define, and there's many moving parts, and I don't think it's going to be a well-settled area of law for a while. So, you know, a lot of times you just call the examiner up, the examiner interview, or read what he wrote, go by the suggestion of what the proper wording is. All right. So, how to overcome many one-on-one -on -one rejections. Next slide. So, as I kind of spoke about this. We kind of changed the words of what we'll say today. Um, follow what's suggested. And you can't patent a law in nature, but you can, patently, you can patent the conditions for doing such a thing or whatever it is. You find another way to write it. And feel free to contact me. Feel free to send in questions if you want to talk about that more. Be happy to talk about it. It's an area, it's an area I find fascinating. Where do you define the difference between abstract and tangible? Nothing's really abstract, but everything really is. You know, how, how do you define that? Uh, it's an area of science, which is you know discovering all of these things and uh, trying to find uh, the God particle and so forth, and seeing you know where where does this lie? Where does our created universe lie in comparison, or whatever you may believe? Um, prior art rejections. So next section and prior art rejections. So that's all I'm going to say on non-prior art rejections. Now we're going to the real meat. So the first review of an office action. Uh, the goal is to break it down to manageable pieces. This is, to quote many who have said th such things as this before me, there is the emotion, there is logical, there's logical things. The um, person known as the, the rabbi known as Ram Hall breaks this down very nicely. It's actually where I'm quoting this from. See, I like to quote my sources. Uh, <laughs> he, he, he wrote in about the 1700s, and he, he wrote that certain things are dictated by your logic, and certain things are dictated by your emotion. And the, uh, when you first receive something that's huge, you receive it with many different pieces, then y your emotion will take over. Oh no, how can I do this? You look at this in the big picture, what do I do with it? So you want to break it down to its component parts. Look at each part separate and logically. And that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to give my method of how I break it down into its component parts. How you look at each piece logically, analyze it, dispense with it, go on to the next one, and then your emotion will follow, you come up with the big picture, you'll understand it. So, the way that I recommend doing this is don't get caught up in the office action. Don't even read, don't even read the, the office action's arguments because you're going to get caught up in what he's saying and you're not going to keep it straight. First component part you need to understand, what are you claiming? What's your invention? What's the quote-unquote essence of it? What's there? Based on what the essence of your invention is, based on what you're doing, you know, based on, you know, what are you getting at? Uh, then you can take that and you can understand it. Now, once you understand your invention, which oftentimes be two or three years later, you got to reread it, reread the claims or the summary or whatever to refresh your recollection. You can go back now, look at the office action, look at what he cited, get a sense of those, get a sense of what he cited. Read those. Read at least the abstract, maybe the summary, maybe the claims, maybe look at the figures, depending on how well it's drafted and what's intelligible in it. Uh, and understand that. You know, take notes as you're doing it. Okay, this is what I'm doing. This is what he's doing over here. You might know right away, all right, that's totally different. Or you might just, you know, uh, maybe there is something there. You don't know exactly, but first get straight in your head what you're looking at before you get confused by what someone else is going to say about it. Uh, all right, so. As I've written, the systematic order that I recommend, review your patent application. Review the claims first. Uh, review the, the major prior art cited. Look for differences. Once you do that, you know your differences, you're ready, to, uh, you're ready now to look at it. So first, start with a high level analysis. I call this the LCTA method. Why? Because the initials fit and I made it up because I can't find any previous treatise, previous anything telling you how to analyze an office action properly. You know, um, I don't practice that regular law that most lawyers do. Uh, what's it called? IRAC. That's what we learned in law school, the IRAC method. Well, I call this the LCTA method of responding to an office action. So, before we get started, next slide. The slide's name is before we get started. Uh, check the earliest filing date of each cited reference. Make sure it's a valid prior art citation. Until 2013, at some point, the law is changing. Uh, it's first to file. Prior art is only going to be, uh, uh, it will be used against you unless it's your own public disclosure within one year. That part of 35 U.S.C. 102B is remaining. But 
Uh, we won't be able to swear behind other references as far as I understand. I'm not an expert in that area yet because yeah, I got time to learn it, right? 